Listen only mode. Good afternoon or, or greetings. We join you uh, bright and early from the United States at, where it's 730 in the morning Eastern time. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today on LSVT BIG, uh, which is an evidence-based physical and occupational therapy program for Parkinson's disease. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm one of the LSVT BIG faculty members and chief clinical officer of LSVT BIG for LSVT Global. And I'm joined today by two other physical therapists and LSVT BIG instructors, Heather Cianci and Beth Marcoux, uh, both from the United States. And we're very excited to, to be here with you today. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, before we get started with today's presentation, we would like to acknowledge our funding support that has made LSVT Big possible and what it is today. Some of those grants are listed on the bottom of the slide, and we've been provided support by the Davis Finney Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Park Parkinson Alliance, and others. So I'd like to go over our plan for the webinar today. Uh, this may be the first time you've joined a live webinar like this. So we're going to go over some logistics. And then I'm going to turn it over to Beth and to Heather to review um, the content for today's webinar. At the end of the webinar, we're going to talk about some exciting opportunities and resources, uh, namely how this LSVT Big Training and Certification Workshop for Physiotherapists and Occupational Therapists is coming to the UK uh, in March. And at the end, we'll have some time to address your questions. So in terms of logistics, um, here's how the webinar will work today. Right now, everyone in the audience is automatically muted so that there's no background noise from the various environments from which you might be joining us. Uh, but at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time to answer your questions live. There are a few ways that you can ask questions. You'll notice on the right side of your screen, there's a control panel and there's a little word that says questions. If you um, hit the plus sign on that, it'll open up a question box and you can type in your question. When we see your question, we'll read it out loud to the audience. Um, it'll be anonymous, your name won't be included, and uh, one of the presenters will answer your question. Another way that you can ask a question live is to raise your hand. There's a little hand icon on your control panel. Oh, so when I see that you have your hand raised, I'll unmute your microphone if you have a microphone built in so that you can answer your question um, or ask your question live to the group. And the third way, if we run out of time today for your questions or you think of any questions later, you can simply email us at info as an in information, I-N-F-O, at lsvtglobal.com and I'll display that address at the end of our webinar today too. You might notice that there's um, a handout attached of the slides of today's webinar so feel free to download those and print those for your reference. We will show two videos today. Um, the quality of the videos will play back depending on your internet connection and on my internet connection. Uh, but please note that both of those videos can be seen on our website um, under the videos and resources tab. Also, uh, the audio connection may be variable depending on, again, your internet connection. Um, and so if there's something you're not hearing, please feel free to uh, ask a question if you need something clarified at the end of the webinar. So now I'd like to give you a little bit more information on our webinar presenters, Heather and Beth, and very excited to have them as presenters today because they're both excellent instructors, and we're so um, fortunate that we we're able to send them over to the UK to do the LSVT Big Training and Certification Workshop in March. And so the, the same webinar presenters will be your instructors then if you uh, attend the course, which we hope you do. I'll give you a little bit of background from on them. Um, Heather is from Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia area, where she works at the Dan Aaron's Parkinson's Rehab Center. She is a 
uh, geriatric certified specialist, and she is an expert in uh, Parkinson's. She's been on an advisory board for Cure PSP and has done a number of continued education courses um, specialized in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Beth Marcoux has um, spent uh, the majority of her career in education of other physical therapists and is also an LSVT big certified clinician and expert in the care of people with Parkinson's disease. Here are objectives of our presentation. We would like to just briefly expand, uh, explain the advances in neuroscience that have made a huge impact on the field of rehabilitation today. We're going to discuss the development and data on an efficacious speech treatment called LSVT Loud, which you may or may not heard of. And then we're going to describe the development data and exercises of LSVT Big, which is the main thing we're going to be focusing on today. And lastly, we're not only going to talk about resources, but we're going to give you some instructions on how you can become an LSVT Big certified uh, PT or OT in the UK in 2016. So with that, I'm going to turn our presentation over to uh, Beth, I believe, who's going to start you off today. Hello, I'm very excited to be with you today. Um, and we like to say that it's absolutely a stunning time to be in rehab um, because we understand even more now at a molecular level how exercise affects our brains. We've always known that exercise had tremendous impact for and benefit for our cardiovascular and musculoskeletal systems, but we now know that it has a very potent effect on our central nervous system as well. And researchers have been able to identify those key principles of exercise that drive neuroplasticity and help make those positive changes in function in the brain. It used to be that um, physicians would only refer patients with Parkinson's disease to therapy in the later stages when they needed um, compensation or walkers or assistant, assistive devices. But now, um, and rarely did they ever refer them for the primary symptoms, but now because of the research that's been done, we know that exercise can help to benefit their function, improve their brain functioning, and may actually even slow the disease progression. So we now know that exercise is medicine. Next slide, please. Patients with Parkinson's disease typically re re receive a triad of, of treatments. Mo most or all of them are on some kind of medication for it, typically some form of levodopa. Um, patients may later receive some neurosurgical treatments, such as deep brain stimulation. Um, but in addition, we now know that all patients should be receiving speech, physical, and occupational therapy, not only to improve their daily function, but also to empower them and to give them hope and, and confidence that they do have some power over Parkinson's. Next slide, please. Because pictures are worth a thousand words, I want to introduce you to Bernie. Bernie was 71 years old at the time that, that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 1994, and he was referred because he was having difficulty walking and a history of falls and freezing. He was um, home yard stage three, and at the time the videos were taken, he was optimized on his Parkinson's medications. Um, so the next um, slide that you see is going to be a video, and on the left-hand side you'll see pre-Bernie, walking before he um, received LSVT big, and on the right-hand side is post-Bernie after four weeks of treatment. So notice the difference in his gait and the difference in his stride length, the difference in his arm swing, um, the difference in his velocity. You can already see on the right-hand side he's through the doorway, whereas on the left-hand side he's still approaching the doorway. Um, notice the freezing, slight hesitation when he goes through the doorway with the change from the tile to the carpeting. And as you can see, soon you'll see a picture. His gait is not perfect, um, but it's certainly on the right-hand side, but it's certainly a, a lot better um, than it was on the left. So you can see him approach his car on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, notice the arm swing. Let's 
So it's easy to see from this video that Bernie made significant clinical changes. Um, and in this next in this slide, you see the objective data, the objective outcomes. So he was falling once or twice a month, um, pre-treatment and post-treatment, he wasn't falling at all. Um, he lost the cane, he was no longer using a cane for ambulation. Um, his gait velocity improved significantly, and you can see that when they considered his, age, his velocity to his age match norms, he had reached 100%. So he was walking at the same speed as all of his age match peers. And he had significant improvement in his um, endurance. So his goals were to be able to improve his walking, to go to the movies, to play with his grandchildren, and to be out with his family and friends. And he made all those significant changes. So for Bernie, this was a clinically significant um, improvement. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what is LSBT at big, and, and where did we begin? Um, next slide. This is Mrs. Lee Silverman, and she is the person for whom this treatment is named. Um, in the late 1980s, Dr. Lorraine Ramick went to Scottsdale, Arizona to help Mrs. Silverman because she was no longer able to make her speech loud enough that she could be understood by her family and friends. And so it was at the Lee Silverman's um, Center for Parkinson's Diseases in Scottsdale, Arizona, that Dr. Ramick developed the LSVT Loud treatment, which is the basis for LSVT Big, the physical and occupational protocol. Next slide. On this next slide, you can see the 25 plus year journey um, of, of funding that Dr. Ramick has, and others have received from invention of LSVT Loud to the scale up. And so um, LSVT. Global has been very fortunate to receive over $8 million in National Institute of Health funding um, from, the, and, and from the early 2000s to the present. Very, very fortunate to um, continue that funding and with the goal of disseminating the information that they've gathered over all these years and to um, hopefully get other practitioners to use LFBT Big so that all those patients with Parkinson's can benefit. Um, that we're trying to disseminate the information through the, to our medical allied health and Parkinson's communities. So these webinars are just one other way that we um, accomplish that. Next slide, please. We're very excited to say that there are now over 1,600 LSVT loud clinicians certified in 69 different countries and over 10,000 LSVT big certified clinicians in 38 countries. Um, and so um, LSVT loud has become the standard of care for speech treatment around the world and LSVT big is um, close on its heels to becoming more and more recognized every year. So we certainly hope that you will become one of those um, LSVT big clinicians, next slide, because you can see that people with Parkinson's in the uh, UK really need you, that there are 273 loud certified clinicians, but only 17 LSVT big certified clinicians, and yet there are over 125,000 people in the UK with Parkinson's disease. So you are needed. Um, next slide, please. LSVT big programs are administered in a way that challenges the impaired system. Um, they really adhere to the principles of neuroplasticity um, and the techniques that have been developed are specific to Parkinson's deficits of bradykinesia and hypokinesia. Um, but unlike most of the common traditional PT and OT treatments, they really address the kinesthetic awareness or those sensory deficits that, that patients with Parkinson's seem to have. Next slide. So what I'd like you to do is just think about if you were to say, how are you in a normal voice, and then say to yourself, how are you in a loud voice, think about the changes that you feel when you say that. So when, one of the things that you'll notice when you speak in your louder voice is that your posture improves, you sit up straighter, your mouth opens, you have better breath support, um, and you have louder, um, your voice is obviously louder, and you have much better articulation. So all of these changes occurred simply by speaking louder versus that get, having to give you a number of cues like sit up straight, open your eyes, take a deep breath. So it's important to note that we're always training for healthy loudness or healthy normal movements. We're not teaching patients to speak too loud, but it just feels too loud to them, again, because of that sensory um, deficit. So next slide, please. 
So LSVT Loud was um, developed first, and it is the foundation of LSVT Big. So like LSVT Big, there are a series of daily exercises or daily tasks that take up the first half of the session. So the goal is to rescale the amplitude or volume of motor output through some, some exercises. So the first one is a sustained ah, where they'll say ah for 15 repetitions and hold it for as long as they can. Because the voice can go up or down, they also do highs and lows. Ah, 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 and they do that again 15 times. And the third exercise that they do is identify five functional tasks or phrases that they repeat a minimum 50 times per day. So there you can see is the principle of repetition and repetition matters. Those functional phrases might be things like, what's for supper, um, do you want to have, did you take the dog out, anything like that, like that that they might say several times a day. The next part of the treatment, the other half of the treatment, is working on hierarchical speech um, tasks where they would, over the four week, weeks, train for use of louder, more normal voice into functional speech. They build endurance and complexity, but they never hit a ceiling. So if you begin with words and phrases, shorter and simpler things, um, working up to sentences, reading, and finally conversation at the same time that they're changing the complexity of the environment. So that maybe by the end of the fourth week, they're sitting in a loud um, area with several other people talking at the same time. <coughs> Next slide, please. So one of the barriers to generalization um, of getting people to use their loud or normal voice in all situations is this mismatch um, between their perception of how they sound like and how they really sound. So one of the problems is the sensory problem. They're not really aware that they're soft or that their arm swing is, is not what it should be or that their stride length is shorter than what other people are. And when you ask them to build it to the normal volume or the normal speed of walking, they think that they're walking too big or talking too loud. I, I'm not too soft. I can't, I can't speak like this. I'm shouting. So they, it's, a, it's a mismatch of perception. And so what, one of our jobs is to make them more aware of that mismatch of perception and help them to correct and to reach normal levels. Next slide, please. A key study was done by Dr. Ramig in 2001 that showed not only that is the target of amplitude or loudness the right target, but also that the treatment effects of loud are long-lasting. <clears throat> Along the bottom of the slide, on the, on the horizontal axis, is months in time, and on the, the vertical axis is um, decibels, or amplitude of, of sound. And so you can see the two groups, one received LSVT loud, that's the group in red at the top, and the second group received just some breathing and exercises. They were asked to read a passage, and at the end, um, and they measured their decibels before and after. Um, at the end of the four-week treatment, you can see that the group that received LSVT loud um, spoke in more, more normal voice. Both groups improved initially, but you can see that over the 24 months or two years of time, the LSVT loud folks were able to maintain that loudness where the other group fell back. Um, it's important to note that the study ended after two years, um, so there's no, we don't have any information about how long it really would last, but we do know that there was no treatment in between, so that effects of the initial four weeks of treatment actually was able to be maintained for two years. Next slide. Um, we also know that, uh, again, thinking back to that, asking you to speak louder, when you speak in a, in a, in a louder tone, Many, many things change, <clears throat> and there's been lots of research to establish that this spread of effects really does occur. So you can see that the facial expressions change, the articulation improves, the respiratory kinematics and aerodynamics improve, the adduction of the vocal cords improve, so they have improved swallowing, and all of them are seen over many systems just with the key to speak loud. <clears throat> so the research that's been done has been done with some, that they've measured function with PET scans, um, and so the, they do have data that shows the efficacy of LSBT lab and the changes that occur in all of these systems. Next slide, please. So how did LSBT lab become LSBT big? 
there were two researchers, Dr. Rebecca Farley and Dr. Cynthia Fox, both getting their PhDs at the University of Arizona. And they worked to make the transition between LSBT loud to LSBT big, wondering if LSBT loud was so successful, how could we make it important and improve um, voter function as well. Next slide. So what are the fundamentals of LSVT big? Well, it's a standardized, research-based, specific protocol with a target of bigness or amplitude. So our goal for these patients is to get them to move bigger. The mode of the treatment is intensive and high effort, and the goal is generalization. Can you click the slides, Laura? There you go. And the, uh, so the, the goal is generalization. So we're trying to address that, those sensory mismatches that occur, help them to develop internal cueing, and address some of those neuropsychological changes that occur with Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. Um, at the workshops that we do, we typically bring in a patient, bring in patients for clinicians to work with on the second day. <clears throat> and this is actually a sketch that was handed to one of the instructors at the workshop. It was drawn by a workshop participant who had Parkinson's disease. He was so moved after just one hour of treatment session that he sketched him on this napkin. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's the perception of himself and his movement before attending just the patient practicum that you can see. It's on the left-hand side. And as you can see, after his hour-long session, his perception of himself was much different. He's not only is his stride length longer, his arm swing is bigger, but he's going faster, he's standing up straighter, and he even looks happy. So in the clinic, this is what we see happen over and over and over again with LSVP Big. Um, it looks like he lost his tail and he grew a little hair, but we don't guarantee that that will happen with LSVP Big. Next slide, please. So how is it delivered? Well, it's delivered by certified LSVT Big physical and occupational therapists in a one-to-one -one situation. So it is not a group program. Um, it takes, patients are seen four consecutive days per week for four weeks, 16 sessions for one month, each session being 60 minutes. Um, there are daily assignments given to help patients carry over the skills they learn with you in the clinic um, to the general um, environments in their lives. And they're also given daily homework that they do for 30 days of, of the entire month and for the rest of their lives. Next slide, please. So why do we deliver it in this intensive manner? Well, because we now know, and, um, that, and there's great evidence, a recent study came out in the JAMA in 2016, um, that less intensive PT and OT may be ineffective. Um, intensity is a key parameter of driving that activity-dependent neuroplasticity, and intensive repetitive practice is needed in Parkinson's due to that underlying non-motor symptoms that interfere with learning and improvement of motor symptoms. So we know that in order to make changes in patients with Parkinson's disease, treatment has to be highly intensive. Um, seeing them once or twice a week over four to eight weeks um, just isn't really effective. Next slide, please. Again, it's because we're trying to address that mismatch um, of perception and output. Um, so they, they think that their world they think that they're, they're normal and that their world is normal size, but yet when you treat them, they realize how lost the world had become. One of my patients commented that he felt his arms got longer. And I asked him to explain, and he said, well, before my world was here, but now my world is out here. So um, it's really quite an amazing treatment to see. Next slide, please. So just to review, um, patients with Parkinson's have this reduced drive from their brain, and it results in, in smaller, reduced amplitude motor output. So this results in those small movements, small, slow movements that you see with people with Parkinson's disease. They don't recognize that their movements are small and slow, or even the extent to which they're small and slow. So they continue to self-cue that reduced drive, and so they get stuck in this movement pattern. Next slide. Following treatment, post LSBT big treatment, um, you can see that their focus has changed. So they start, they, the LSBT big perturbs that motor system and increases the amplitude of out motor output so that their movements are larger. And so because they have these larger movements, they have an improved self-perception or self-awareness of how to move 
in a more normal pattern, which results in internal cueing um, to be with attention to making large movements, and then again it results in the increased larger amplitude. So this is the move movement pattern that we hope to see and typically do see at the end of um, four weeks of LSVT. Next slide, please. So just to provide you some data, in 2010, um, the LSBT big study was done in Berlin, Germany. Um, and this is just a slide that shows you the randomization of, of patients. Um, so there were 60 patients who were randomly assigned to um, LSVT big to the Nordic walking program, which is typically how uh, the treatment's done in Germany for patients with Parkinson's disease, and to a home exercise program that focused on balance and strengthening. Um, the LSVT big program was given four times a week for four weeks, um, and the Nordic walking was traditionally done for twice a week for eight weeks, um, but all participants received the same number of hours of exercise. Um, Post-treatment, there were 20 in the LSVT big group and 19 in each of the others. And you can see that one withdrew because of um, consent and the other um, due to psychosis. At the 16-week follow-up, 20 had continued in the LSVT big group and 19 in each of the other two groups. Next slide, please. So the United Parkinson's disease um, scale is the typical scale that's used in research. And one thing that you need to know about that scale is that lower scores mean higher function. So the better you do, the lower your score. So looking at this um, table, this graph, you can see um, that across on the horizontal axis is weeks of time, and on the vertical axis is um, improvement so, um, uh, scores. So you can see the LSVT big group is the diamond, the walkers are, the Nordic walking group is the squares, and the home exercise program are the triangles. All three groups started out the exact same, you can see the left hand side, that four weeks there was a very large change, difference between them. The LSVT big group got better, their scores dropped, whereas the other two groups got a little bit worse. Um, as time continued, um, eight weeks, you can see that the LSVT group continued to get better, um, and it continued to get better for the whole 16 weeks of the study. Um, this difference that you see in the LSVT big group and the other two groups is equal to five standard deviations. If this had been an NIH study for a medication, the study would have been stopped and medication would have been approved. So this was a huge study and huge results um, for our LSVT big. Next slide, please. I think this is where I'm going to turn it over to Heather, who's going to talk to you about um, the program and, and fine motor movements. Great. Thank you so much, Beth. So Beth has talked to us a little bit about the motor sensory disorder component of Parkinson's disease and how we use LSVT big to really intensify that amplitude and effort of the movement. And I think people can really see that. I think people understand that taking bigger steps is something we've long told people with Parkinson's disease to do. But I think sometimes people have a more difficult time in understanding, well, what about some of the small movements? What about some of the fine motor tasks? And when we do an analysis of individuals with Parkinson's disease, we can see that even the small movements in people with Parkinson's are too small. When we think about movements that people do, specifically with those fine motor movements. We oftentimes hear about our patients saying, well, I really have a hard time with my handwriting. It gets very small and cramped. I can't read my own handwriting anymore. I'm really having a difficult time with buttons. I have to ask my spouse to help me with that. I'm using a button hook to help me. I've switched hands. I can no longer brush my teeth with my dominant hand because that's the side that my symptoms are on and maybe I'm even moving to an electric toothbrush. And patients talk a lot about ADLs in the kitchen where they're having a difficult time with actually stirring and preparing meals. So these movements, while they're already small movements, they become much more into a tight, small movement for these patients. And really, we can actually take those fine motor tasks and make those larger amplitude and actually improve the quality of life with the ADLs for patients. So we're going to take a look at the next slide, and we're going to see a video of a gentleman using the LSVT big technique to help with his buttons. Good, and I want you to just kind of uh, notice as you're 
So what we're seeing in this video here is the patient uncued. He's showing us how he goes ahead and buttons his top button. I want you to notice how you can see the white knuckles. You can see he's very much struggling. And see how little space there is actually between the fingers when he's doing that movement. So this going to be a very frustrating thing for a lot of And it's taking him quite some time to actually be able to get that button buttoned. So it took him 38 seconds to button that top button. Ready? One. Now, after he's worked with his LSVT big certified therapist in doing large amplitude movements with really driving force and flicking the fingers open, what you're going to see is he has a little bit more space in between those fingers. You're going to see that he was able to button that button in 10 seconds. So he improved the ability with that. Now, what his therapist is telling him now is to button that button in an angry way. So we're talking about using more effort. So again, we brought his time down from 38 seconds to 10 seconds to now 5 seconds. And that was simply by having this patient work on making larger amplitude movements and by using more effort and force and drive. Next slide. This is another example of how LSVT big work with those fine motor movements. We're looking at handwriting and on the left side of your screen you're looking at uncued writing, micrograph fullness of the movement in those. You can see by the time that patient gets down to number 10 on the left side, preparing meals on my own, how much more legible the handwriting becomes and how much tighter and smaller those actual letters are. When we look at right side of the screen, this is actually the handwriting post-treatment, so after treatment. And this was actually something that the LSVT big therapist did not work on this patient. This was not a trained task. This is simply the effect of the patient learning to make all of their movements bigger and to put more effort and more drive into what they are doing. So there really are some beautiful generalization effects that can come out of LSVT big that can help patients in all realms of their life, whether or not we train them specifically for it or not. Next slide. So let's take some time now and actually look at the specific treatment protocol. Next slide. So an overview of week for four weeks. So that means that the patient has 16 sessions within one month, and then each of those sessions are 60 sessions. Now I know sometimes this frightens patients and this frightens physiotherapists and occupational therapists, thinking that this is a lot of treatment. But if we think about some of our typical treatment sessions, we know that the research shows that if we see patients less frequently and that less regularly, for less amount of time, that the amount of progress that patients make is really not going to be as fruitful as we want it to be. So by really condensing the treatment down into a true teaching form of getting these patients to understand the drive and the size of their movements and working with them in these consecutive days, we really help these patients to learn and to produce these large amplitude movements. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of the treatment session. What you're seeing on the side of the left side of your screen are the maximal daily exercises. These are seven exercises that were developed off of the LSVT loud protocol. We have two exercises that are sustained, meaning the patient holds that to help work on strength and posture and sustaining the ability with movements throughout ADLs. The remainder of the five exercises are exercises that help with balance, coordination, and many more things that we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. After the seven maximal daily exercises, we do something called functional component tasks. These are five everyday tasks that the patient performs five times, one of which is always sit to stand because we know that the majority of our patients do struggle with this. The other 
four of the functional component tasks are chosen by the patient with the help of the therapist. Then we move into our hierarchy tasks, and these also are patient and identified tasks. This is where we're asking the patient, what are the things that you're really having difficulty with? What would you like to be able to do better? And if we're thinking about someone who may be newly diagnosed or someone who is on the younger onset side of the spectrum, then these are things that would you really, really be troubled with if you lost the ability to do. So these are things that are very important to the patient and things that help the patient not only with what they're doing, but with who they are. And we're going to build that complexity. We start out simply in the beginning, and then we push it all the way over those four weeks of treatment towards that patient being able to reach that long-term goal. And then, of course, throughout all the sessions, we're working on the big walk. And this is big walking with patients with rollators, with patients with canes, with patients with no adapted device. So that is what an overall treatment session looks like. And I'm going to take you through some of the exercises, and we'll talk more in detail about each of these. So let's look at the next slide. So our first exercise here in the maximal sustained movements is called the floor to ceiling. What you need to notice in this is not just the bigness of her posture and how big the legs are apart, but we're also looking at the bigness of the hands. It's equally important for the patients to spread those fingers apart. We're having the patient start in a position, not like this picture, but with the hands reaching out forward. They reach down to the floor. They reach up to the And then they pull the arms back into this open position and external rotation. And this is the point in the picture where the patient is going to sustain the movement and hold it for upwards of 10 seconds and you can see how much effort and drive and force a patient would need to do this. So we're working on keeping everything open and up and being the opposite of what Parkinson's typically does, which is round our patients over and tighten their movements in. Let's move on to our next exercise. The second one is side to side. This is also a sustained movement. This is the hold position for this exercise. In the beginning, we have the patient facing forward in the chair with the arm out to the side, and then they make this large sweeping movement across the body and then reach into this diagonal. What we really like about this one is you can see how it works on hip extension, and we know that many of our patients with Parkinson's disease suffer from tight hip flexors, from inactivity, and from the amount of sitting that they do throughout the day. This really works on a beautiful and really drives that leg to push forward. This is excellent for helping patients with reaching across to buckle a seatbelt in the car, reaching across to turn a light on the table, and they're really links to function, and we're going to talk about how we take that exercise, we explain to the patient, these are the physiological benefits of what's going on in your body, but let's talk more about how this can help you from a functional standpoint. So let's move on to our following exercises. Now we move into the multi-directional movements. These are repetitive movements where we take the patients on a back and forth journey of stepping. Our first exercise is the forward step. What you're seeing in this picture is where the therapist is actually stepping forward. This is not a sustained position. The therapist would start with the feet together and the hands in front. They take a big step forward, pull the arms back big, keep the hands open big, and then return back. So a stepping forward and back motion. It can be started on one side of the body and then to the other, or patients can go right into an alternating fashion. So you can see how this can really challenge a patient who has any kind of balance difficulty or patients who are not taking a big enough step when they walk. Also, we're looking at the beautiful posture and how that patient is able to sustain that movement while being balanced. Let's look at the second multidirectional repetitive exercise, which is going to be our sideways step. So again, the patient starts in the standing position, feet together, arms in front of them, and then they take this really nice big step out to the side. You can see how there is external rotation of the foot and how, again, we're working on that external rotation of the shoulders and the big hands to really promote the motions that are opposite to what Parkinson's does to our patients. Again, we're getting the patient to look in that direction, so that can be challenging for patients who are really used to just looking at the ground as they're walking with those small motions. 
And then we talk to our patients about, think about this motion for when you have to take a step to turn. So think about the big step that you took with your sideways step and reach, and we're going to use that movement to help us step to make a turn. So again, linking the exercises back to something functional for the patient. Let's look at our next multi-directional exercise. And that's our backward step. And this one can really be the most concerning for a lot of patients uh, for fear of falling for our patients who may have problems with retropulsion. What we're looking at here, again, normally the patient would be starting in that upright position with the hands reaching out in front. What we're asking the patient to do is to take a good quality step backwards to bend forward at the hips and then to push those shoulders into extension. What you're also going to see is on that front foot, we're asking them to get into a nice dorsiflexion. And again, this is something that is very challenging for our people with Parkinson's because we know that they lose a degree of heel strike and get more into the shuffling. So this is a really good exercise to help the patients to promote that feeling of heel strike, but also with working on the shoulder extension, which is something that they really need to do when we're working on that reciprocal arm swing. So this is an excellent exercise for, again, helping patients with reaching an arm back into a coat or perhaps stepping back to have a seat in a chair. Let's move on to our next exercise, exercise number six. And this is also a multidirectional repetitive movement, but this is not a stepping exercise. This is really a big weight shifting exercise. This is forward and backward rock and reach where the patient is in this wide staggered stance and we're having the patient work on anterior and posterior weight shifting. We're having them rock on the feet where they are lifting the heel of the back leg, and then when they rock back, they lift the toes on the front leg. Simultaneously, the patient is swinging the arms back and forth. And while you're seeing the perfect picture here with our model, we know that most of our patients with Parkinson's initially are not going to feel comfortable with that degree of weight shift we know that they're not going to reach that big in front of them or behind them. This is a beautiful exercise to really help them feel comfortable with that amount of reach and that amount of reciprocal movement quality that they need really for gait throughout the rest of their lives. And let's look at our last exercise. This also is probably one of the most disconcerting exercises for our patients, but absolutely one of the most beneficial. We know that our patients with Parkinson's lose a great degree of axial mobility, especially with rotation. They have difficulty with turning in bed and, and reaching behind them. So this is the sideways rock and reach. Again, look at the model's amount of weight shift. We see how she's lifting the heel and how she's completely turning and looking behind her. Again, lifting those arms in a large fashion and turning the head in that direction too. So really making that patient move perhaps out of their comfort zone, but teaching them how that this motion can actually help them again with functional mobility and really improving their gait and quality of life. So those are our seven foundational exercises that we start with. And let's move on and talk about how we take these exercises more into the realm of function. We like to think of these exercises really as our stepping stones for using good big movement throughout everyday life. It is not our be-all and end-all goal for patients to be 100% completely perfect in all of these exercises. We want to use these exercises to get them to understand how to imply and push these large amplitude big movements into everyday life. So we talk about that in the next slide here where we're saying that it's a tool to facilitate improved movements. It's not the end goal of therapy. If we go back to the rock and reach where we were talking about the weight shifting and the reciprocal arm movement, again, that can coincide with how do I take a walk outside? How do I make that big weight shift? How do I take those large steps? So we're always referring the patient not to just perfection of the exercise, but how does that exercise then lead into what I need to be able to do in a better way? So then when we move from our exercises, we move into our functional component tasks. These are patient-driven. Again, these are chosen by the patient with the help of the therapist. One of them is always the big sit-to-stand, where we're really teaching patients how to make that anterior reach forward. Then we up that patient to pick other things. We've given you a list of some of the other movements here that some patients have chosen. This is not a final list. These are just some ideas that you can do. 
These are, again, patient-driven. They're performed five times, and each of them five times. Next slide. So they're mental sticky notes. We're using those functional component tasks for the patient to think big. Okay, every time I get up out of this chair, I have to move big. When I reach into my pocket, I have to really open my hand big to pull out what I need. When I make that turn to get out of the doorway into the kitchen, again, I make that big step. So it's a great way to help the patient to think big throughout the whole day and make it part of their normal activities. Next slide. Then we move on to our hierarchy tasks. Again, these are real-world tasks driven by the patient. These are things the patient either does not want to lose the ability to do or really wants to be able to do better. So you can see how these are multi-step um, tasks. These are not just a simple one-step task. So it could be activities like playing tennis or golfing or hiking, or it could be something as simple as being able to get the mail um, or the ability to simply get in and out of bed. So again, we start out simple with these movements, and by the end of those 16 sessions, the patient is performing the full motion of what they're doing, and we're making it as challenging as possible for them. Next slide. So when we think about the hierarchy and how we start out simply and then we increase it over the 16 sessions, we have to break down the task. So if we're thinking about preparation for a meal, there's so many steps that go into that. First of all, retrieving the ingredients, gathering the tools, preparing the food, putting things together by stirring them, putting them in and out of the oven, setting the table, serving the food. So you can see how a hierarchy can be broken down into those subtasks, each of those practiced in a big way. And finally, by the end, putting that full hierarchy together so that the patient is able to complete everything in a big amplitude way and in a safe way. Next slide. So again, think about what are we considering with our hierarchy. Really, our goal is calibration. We want that patient to be able to think about what they're doing. The patient begins to self-critique or self-cue themselves. They're thinking about, did I lift this bowl as big as I could? Did I take a big enough step? Was I able to safely make that turn? And we're using our verbiage and our bodies to help the patient learn about that. We're saying things like, did you use that high effort and bigness to get out of that chair? Are we using those big movements that we've been working on with the exercises while we're actually performing this activity of daily living and this functional task? When the patient is able to say, I wasn't big enough, I could have done that better, I need to fix that, and our patient is able to continually do that, that is our goal and that means our patient is calibrated and we've been able to help give them back quality of life and safety. Next slide. All sessions also contain big walking, and we're talking about patients who are using a rollator, patients who are using a cane, and patients who aren't using devices. We're trying to get patients to take those big steps, to get that big arm swing, so they can get the pelvic mobility, they can get the trunk rotation. Usually in the beginning, this will feel very awkward to the patient, and we tell them if it doesn't feel awkward or it doesn't feel too big, then it's probably not big enough. And through those 16 sessions, we're going to help that patient normalize their amplitude, get that stride length and the posture and the arm swing to where it needs to be so that it doesn't feel so ridiculous, it may not look so ridiculous, and now the patient is able to get places in a safe manner and in a faster way. Because if they're able to get places with fewer steps, then we know they're taking bigger steps and they're able to accomplish a safe walk. Next slide. And then the last thing we do is we assign a carryover task or a carryover exercise to our patients. And that's a daily assignment that we give them um, for a real life situation outside of therapy. So we're getting them to use a big movement in the real world when they're not with their therapist to try to provoke that big amplitude. We make these more challenging over the four weeks. These are specific and they really make the patient accountable. So I may say to my patient, what are you doing after therapy today? Well, I need to go and buy some new shoes. So I may say to my patient, okay, when you go into the shoe store and you reach for that box of shoes that may be on the shelf, I want you to make sure that you take a big step and a big reach when you pull those shoes off the shelf. And to progress that over the four weeks, 
I may be making that patient do a multi-step task by the end of those sessions where the patient is really putting those big movements into every task that they're doing. So we start out simple and we make it harder and then we really get the patient to use those movements not just in the clinic but outside in the real world so that they're really being able to self-calibrate or self-cue themselves. Next slide. So here's another example. Week one, when you leave the clinic, I want you to walk big to the car with your spouse. Walk big enough that he or she is able to comment about your walking. So we're looking for that patient to get some sort of a um, comment or some sort of a response from people around them. By week three, we look at the change where it's a multi-step where we say, when you go to the restaurant today with your family, I want you to open that door big for someone. Walk to your table big and sit down big. Use your big posture when you order your meal and sit throughout dinner. So now we're helping that patient to really, again, use that big effort and big quality movement throughout everything they do with many more steps. Next slide. So really, what is our goal with LSVT Big? We are really asking people with Parkinson's disease to use their big movements automatically throughout everyday life and that we're really going to have long-term carryover. So no longer will the patient feel that shuffling is the new way of walking, that it should take me longer to get dressed, that this is just the acceptable norm. Now our patients know that they can move better by moving bigger, that these movements start to begin to be automatic, and that they really are able to continue those throughout their lifetime. Next slide. So in summary, just like Beth was talking about in the beginning, we really do have great advances in neuroscience um, that have provided us with a lot of neurobiological and behavioral evidence that really supports the positive impact that we can have in the lives of people with Parkinson's by using exercise-based protocols. We know that we have a lot of literature in physical therapy and exercise protocols, not just in animals anymore, but now in humans with Parkinson's disease. There is 20 plus years of LSVT programs that have been developed and studied. And we acknowledge that LSVT Big is one type of a physical or occupational therapy program that really does have potential to offer improvements in movement and more importantly, in the quality of life for our patients with Parkinson's disease. Next slide. So we have resources out there available to you as well as to your um, work partners as well as your patients within community. We provide webinars for clinicians as well as patients and their family members. We have a clinician directory which lists already certified clinicians. We have an Ask the Expert who is always available to help you with any kind of question you may have. We now have homework helper DVDs where patients can follow along for their LSVT Big and LSVT Loud programs. And in future development, we're now working on Loud for Life and Big for Life, which will be graduate programs for patients once they've completed their one-on-one -on -one sessions to be able to work together with a group of other patients to continue to feel supported and to stay active in their therapy. Next slide. So how can you become LSVT Big certified? We will be hosting a workshop in the UK just within two months now in Derby. Um, that is going to be March 17th and 18th. And we really, really are looking forward to having a good turnout of people here so we can learn and work from each other. You can complete the registration brochure at this website. We really would encourage you to register sooner rather than later because these workshops really do fill up quickly. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn these exercises, to learn this program, to learn how to encourage your patients to have more quality of life. If you need more information, we've listed some phone numbers, emails, and websites here. And we also have the option, if you're not able to travel to us, of taking the LSVT training online. And we've left you with that website there as well. Next slide. We also have some upcoming LSVT Loud workshops. We're going to be hosting this in London on June 24th and 25th. So if you have any speech language pathologists colleagues, please refer them and you can also refer your patients because we do use patient volunteers to help make the learning experience much more fruitful. Next slide.
If you happen to be attending the Movement Disorder Society Congress in Berlin, Germany, please stop by our booth and see us there. We will be at the 20th International Congress of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society, which is in June from the 19th to the 23rd. Please stop by and visit us. The website is here as well for additional information. Next slide. This is a quote from a former patient of ours who was a graduate of both LSVT Big and LSVT Loud. It's a wonderful quote that we love to use wherever we travel to because of the amount of positivity it shows. It is possible to take charge of your life even with Parkinson's. It is possible for your will to override your brain and it is possible to have power over Parkinson's. And that's really what our goal is with LSVT Global. We are really helping patients to take control of their lives and to really make Parkinson's not the be all and end all, but something that they're living with and they're managing and they're able to really control with our help. Next slide. We thank you so much for attending today and I'm going to turn the session back over to Laura, our moderator, and we can help you with any kind of questions that you may have. So thank you for joining us today and, and thank you Heather and Beth for presenting such helpful information. So now's your time. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have patients or duties to get back to and need to sign off, uh, we understand that and we will email you the webinar handout um, after today's webinar. But if you'd like to stay on for a few more minutes and ask questions, I'll just review the three ways quickly in which you can ask a question. Uh, you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon, and when I see that, I'll uh, announce your name out loud so that you can unmute your microphone and ask your question aloud, and one of us will answer you. Um, the other way is you can type in your question into the question box, and once I see that question, I will read it out loud, and one of the presenters will respond. And I do believe we have a hand and a question already, so keep your hand up. I'll get to you in a minute. Um, this question is going to be here, was here for a while, so I'm going to take um, that question first. And the question is this. Um, the listener says, this looks fantastic. I work in an elderly mental health, so Parkinson's is not the reason for referral to the team. However, large amounts have dementia in Parkinson's, and for those who do not have Parkinson's, some of their presentation is similar as fine motor skills reduce in dementia. Has any research been done in patients with dementia? Um, that is, is it as effective, or is this effectiveness reduced due to reduced new learning ability? Um, Beth, are you able to take that question? Sure. Um, there's, there has been research on stages, primarily on stages one to three for patients with Parkinson's, and, and they do have mild um, dementia, some of them at that point. Um, it does somewhat diminish the um, ability to learn new skills, but at that point you change your goals to um, assist the caregivers, um, and that's been very effective. So the, it, it, we find that LSBT big is effective in all stages of Parkinson's. Um, it's just that how you frame your goals and, and what your outcomes are going to be. So yes, it can be successful, even with patients with, with dementia. Um, it, they don't learn the skills as easily, but um, you, they do very well with modeling and, and um, mimicking the behaviors that, that are asked of them, and they move well with cueing. OK, thank you, Beth. And to the person that had your hand up, I don't see your hand raised anymore, so um, feel free to raise your hand again, or you can type in your question into the question box. Um, while we're waiting, I'll move on to the next question, and if Heather, if you want to take this one. I understand that LSVT Big is structured one-to-one -one program over four weeks. From an NIH funding perspective, I'm not sure if it would be achievable in all areas. Is it possible to apply elements of LSVT big with patients? For example, one to two sessions a week with homework or running patient groups? That's an excellent question. Um, a two part answer. The first part is um, we have been in the UK before, we have taught this course before, and we have therapists currently applying this and doing quite well with it. The second part of your answer is no. Unfortunately, you cannot apply just portions of this. Really, the efficacy and the research that we have behind this 
at what we know, not just with LSVT Big, but with the majority of really good quality programs that are out there for patients with Parkinson's, is that it needs to be intensive and it needs to be regular. So we really do stick by and prescribe that four times a week for four weeks. You have to think about the learning curve and the amount of deficits that our patients have, even in our newly diagnosed and young onset. We really can't um, really think about how much that motor sensory disconnect is really underlying there. So it truly does take that number of sessions to get those patients up to the quality of movement that they need. So unfortunately, we're not able to do that. I would say to you, give it a try, get trained in this. Once you see the amount of effect that it has on your patients, you will be a believer too, just like we are, in how much this can help your patients. Thank you, Heather. Um, and we'll talk about that topic much more at the workshop. We'll also talk about solutions and, and experiences. And, and like Beth said in the beginning of the presentation, LSVT Loud has been around for much longer and it's completely supported in the UK um, as um, a funded treatment for people with Parkinson's. And so we really do believe that that's going to happen as well. It's going to become more of a standard of care uh, for people with Parkinson's disease in the UK, just as LSVT Loud has become. All right, Beth, the next question is for you. Um, is it possible to adapt these exercises and concepts to our less mobile and high functioning patients? For example, those with moderate or severe functioning? Another great question, and yes, um, it is possible, and we do cover that in the workshop. Um, you can use chairs to um, support patients on either side for the for any of the exercises. You can um, use different pieces of equipment. You can have them standing in, um, in front of soft um, mats or tables for if they're you're worried about having them fall backwards. Um, they can do all of these exercises can be done. In, in the seated position, and they can even be done in the supine position for those who are in the stage four and five of, of Parkinson's disease. So yes, and we do cover that in the workshop. So great question. Okay, we have a few more um, really great questions. I'm really happy that everyone is able to um, type in these questions. This is wonderful. So the next question, Heather. Um, why is LSVD big predominantly being promoted with Parkinson's disease? Is it appropriate for other movement disorders, and is there any evidence? Fantastic. Uh, currently, right now, the research is only on patients with Parkinson's disease for LSVT big. I can tell you anecdotally, many of us as trainers and therapists have been using it with other movement disorders, um, as well as just your general older adults, your geriatric patient who may um, have slowed down, who may be having balance problems. Um, we would love to have more research and, and um, input into the lives of other patients, so that is definitely something we're working on in the future. But right now our research for the LSVT big is just on patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay, thank you. Um, I will take the, the next question. Can you attend the big workshop on March 17th and 18th if you are an OT student, as in not yet qualified? Does the workshop give you certification? I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, yes, we do accept P physiotherapy and occupational therapy students who are enrolled in those professional programs um, at a reduced fee. So please do, um, do sign up. Um, once you are graduated and able to practice as a professional, we'll send you a professional certificate and you can be listed on our clinic clinician directory in order to receive referrals. Um, until that time, you still are certified as a student, but in order to deliver LSVT Big, you would have to do so um, under the supervision of an LSVT Big certified uh, OT who is uh, a professional and no longer a student. So great question. Okay, a couple more. Again, if you want to stay on, that's great. Um, if you have to jump off and get back to your day, that's fine too. Um, Beth, how does it work for those clinicians that may only see the patients for two weeks whilst they're in the hospital and then referred on to community partners? Another great question and, and another 
perfect um, example of why certification as an LSVT therapist is required. So if you have a patient in the hospital and you're starting LSVT big and you work with them for two weeks, um, you can hand that patient off to a certified LSVT clinician in the community. So it's really important to know who your clinicians are, who you're in your network, um, so they can go from being um, uh, receiving LSVT big in acute care to receiving it in the home setting, and then to being referred to an outpatient setting if that's needed. So um, yes, you can do it, and and it's important that everybody's doing this, understanding the same principles, and have learned the same techniques. So when your patient is handed off from one to the other, they're getting the same treatment. So great question. Okay, thank you, Beth. And uh, Heather, this next question is for you. Is LSVT big usually delivered in a group setting? If so, what criteria are used to include or exclude patients to select those that will benefit the most? Right now, LSVT big is not provided in a group setting. It is a one-on-one -on -one session with that patient. Um, right now, you need to think about, again, that motor sensory disconnect and the challenges that are particular to your patient. So that is why, first and foremost, the patient needs to be seen one-on-one -on -one by the therapist. Once the patient has graduated from the 16 sessions, by all means, a group setting can be put into place and where patients continue, continue to do things together and really help to motivate each other. Um, we are currently working as a company, an organization, on helping therapists to put programs together. Right now, we don't have definitive uh, criteria available for you, but we as trainers have all set forth some of our own groups, and this is something we'd be happy to speak to you about if you'd like to look through the Expert of the Month session. We can help you with that. Great. Thank you, Heather. One of the things that you'll also learn in this workshop is that although LSVT BIG is a standardized protocol, like Heather said in her part of the presentation today, it's completely customized in terms of the needs and goals of each patient. And so when you're going to the parts of the session where you're practicing functional activities, those are very, very specific to each patient, um, which would uh, in turn make it really completely impossible to see more than one patient at once because you're so intensively treating that patient in a one-on-one -on -one setting um, on those specific functional goals. And uh, I think it'll be exciting for you to learn more if you're able to attend the workshop. Okay, so at this time, I don't see any more questions and we're about 10 minutes over. So I really want to thank you once again for joining us today. We hope this webinar was helpful and gave you a little bit of information about what LSVT Big is all about. Um, if you want to see other webinars, we have a whole host of webinars that are available on demand for free um, on our website. You can find them on the home page, go to patient resources and click on on demand webinars and there are many different topics there. Other than that, we hope that we see you uh, in March in Darby. And if you have any questions later on that you can think of, please email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. Thank you, and we wish that you all have a great day.